your survival kit. Your survival kit is one of these bracelets. It's a USB. You can plug it into your computer. It has every single presentation on it. So turn in your evaluation with that little pink slip at the checkout desk. You'll get your certificate of attendance. Those who signed up for CEUs um, will go ahead and fill out the form there, and we'll get you um, your, your bracelet. I also wanted to let you know that every single presentation from today has been video recorded. It will be uploaded to our website, um, so you can go back and watch over and over and over um, and refer your friends. And finally, again, I just really want to stress volunteer opportunity. This conference today um, could not have been done without our volunteers, and we have um, a, four of our volunteers back there, Stacey Hoagland, Nancy Lewis and Better, Gloria and Rafael Cabrera. Um, thank you for volunteering your time and, and really helping put, put the education committee in the forefront of our organization. So with that, please feel free to jo join up and volunteer with us. And I'm going to turn it over to Ricky. And um, thank you again for coming. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, the diehards. I know this has been a long marathon of a day. I appreciate you sticking it out, and uh, I'm glad to be able to back clean up and take us out on hopefully uh, kind of a fun, like Sharon said, stimulating subject. Although, you know, I'm going to get all the, the goofy innuendo out of the way right, uh, right off the bat. Uh, the title, which I love, I can't take credit for, uh, is probably the raciest part of the program. Uh, but, you know, it is one of those subjects uh, that is more often than not avoided and a little bit, uh, a little bit scary. Um, all parents, not just parents of kids dealing with challenges, uh, are a little freaked out by the subject. So I hope um, that this brief presentation will uh, assuage some of that nervousness and, and uh, make it a subject that you want to uh, not avoid, but uh, embrace and recognize as a, a real critically important part of uh, raising our kids. Uh, this is uh, right out of the uh, conference program. We're going to look at uh, how it typically goes and, and look at some strategies. Uh, but really what I want to uh, address uh, as a kind of an overarching theme is to demystify this kind of notion of um, sexuality education because that's the real scary thing. We also know that that's the real controversial thing. Uh, by the way, I didn't introduce myself, uh, Richard Siegel. Uh, sex therapist and sexuality educator and you know even that far it's like one of those cocktail party things you meet somebody oh what do you do and, <laughs> and it's uh, you know it's uh, ooh <laughs> you're what and, oh Harry come here look he's a uh, you know um, and sex therapy is kind of the, uh, uh, the, the newer, more recent half of my career. I spent uh, the first uh, 15 years uh, as a sexuality educator, and that was even goofier, people's responses to it. Uh, and especially for me, because, uh, you know, when people respond that way to hearing that you're a sexuality educator and think that there's absolutely anything sexy about it, I just want to roll my eyes and go, if you had any idea of what I do, I mean, especially the sex ed part of it, is usually so unsexy. I mean, we know the kind of stuff sexuality educators deal with, sexually transmitted infections. Who gets turned on by that, <laughs> uh, right? And really depressing, hardcore kinds of, you know, consequency things, teen pregnancies and abusive relationships and... Um, quite frankly, it, there was a lot of burnout uh, after 15 years of doing that. Went back to school and got a, a counseling degree and then trained as a sex therapist. Now I've got to tell you, that's happy work. That's <laughs> people coming to me, pay me money to get over sexual dysfunctions and learn how to have better sex. And uh, that's a calling that, that I truly love. <laughs> uh, but especially when it comes to, you know, nobody's really doing sex therapy with kids. Those are sexuality education issues. And, of course, the most frustrating aspect of any sexuality educator's life is the reality that we all know but kind of 
again, tend to avoid is that parents are obligatory sexuality educators. You know, so often the educators are the targets of so much controversy and I don't want you in my kid's school and saying penis and vagina and, you know, uh, when the reality is we shouldn't exist. There should be no such thing as sexuality educators because that's what parents are. And, you know, we all know how we all grew up. And most of our parents and many of us as parents would kind of like, well, nobody talked to me. And I learned about it on the playground or in the locker room or from my older brothers or sisters. And, you know, uh, so it's about that preparation. Uh, one of the common reactions I get, uh, uh, you know, like this kind of exhibit hall or health fair kind of setting like we had here today, when folks come up to a table, uh, and very often I get this, ooh, my kids are young. I, I got time before I worry about this. Or sometimes you get, well, my kids are in college, so I guess I kind of missed the boat. And, um, you know, as we'll see uh, from this presentation, um, most of us grew up with this idea of having the talk. And that's what makes it so awkward and artificial and unnatural and terrifying. And, uh, you know, again, the reality is that part of that, that uh, raising sexually healthy uh, young people is in recognizing that uh, the talk is not an event, but a process that begins. You know, if, we, if parents of teens or preteens are so freaked out in anticipation of having the talk about uh, menstruation or a first date or condoms, uh, you know, just think how much easier that talk would be if they've already been having 10 years of talks about uh, you know, body parts and abuse prevention and where babies come from and it's a hell of a lot easier to talk about those things than to freak out thinking about, oh my God, is my kid having sex? Is my kid thinking about having sex? Uh, I mean, I do this for a living and got slammed with the reality of how sexist my conditioning and upbringing was and uh, thinking that well, this brain doesn't matter all the professional titles and labels and the job descriptions. When I became the father of a daughter, I thought, oh, well, this will be a snap. She ain't leaving her room till she's 35. <laughs> Done. Right? And before, you know, the ultrasound was a little foggy and, and not quite clear, so I also ran with that, oh, I might have a son. I'm going to teach him how to play ball and be a badass like his dad and wait up for him when he's out on his first date when he's 16 or 17 with the high fives at the ready because, you know, every dad wants to peacock about what a old man his son is. And, but we have gender scripts. We have sexist kinds of conditionings. We have all of this baggage that we grow up with that generates a lot of that fear. Even right here, as this slide says, what is it and why are we so afraid of it? Well, sex ed is one of those things, we all know what that means on some intuitive level. But uh, as I point out, uh, even with like my college students, they, they uh, love wrapping their head around this point, that this is an abbreviation, right? And we get abbreviations. We deal with them all the time. You know, you're not like driving down the street following directions and you see, uh, you know, make third right on Smith Street and you see signs and get confused. Oh, I don't know where I'm going. That sign says Smith's, but I don't see where Smith Street is. Oh, okay, we get it. As soon as our brain sees the ST, we know it's street and that's where we turn. So we see abbreviations and we translate them immediately. But there's a tricky one here because with sex ed, we don't realize that it's not the, the, abbrevi the only abbreviation is not just the ed part. It's the sex part too. Sex ed is an abbreviation for sexuality education. And when we don't translate that fully, we end up misinterpreting what the whole ball of wax is about. Uh, I once heard uh, former Governor Jeb Bush say that he can't support the teaching, uh, teaching young people how to have sex. And that, that bounced off my head in a weird kind of way. And I thought, who's teaching young people how to have sex? And who, what, who needs that? 
I mean, I thought young people need to be taught how to have sex as much as dogs in the street do, uh, right? But then I realized that that's a really persistent uh, idea, that sex ed stands for sex education, education on how to have sex. And I'm, I wouldn't want my kids getting that from anywhere else, certainly not in a classroom or, uh, you know, there's enough of that in society from the television they watch and the music they listen to. And, and we have to remember that's also a huge part of kids' sex ed. In fact, usually while we're so busy arguing about what they are or aren't getting in schools, again, very unsexy things like STD prevention and AIDS and pregnancy prevention, what they're getting on television and in the music they listen to is some pretty hardcore graphic sex ed. And, and all too often they're emulating and not getting the context or the fantasy. And um, guys, I don't want to embarrass anybody. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but just a rhetorical question. How many of us learned about sex growing up from watching porn or reading dirty magazines and missing the complete context about fantasy and what that particular stuff is for instead of thinking that's a how-to guide, how to have sex, right? So. It's part of the culture, it's part of society, it's part of the world in which we live, and recognizing that sexuality education, rather than teaching about how to have sex, is education about sexual health, which the vast majority of which, as a subject matter, as a, a, a bulk of material, the vast majority of which is not really so much about sex, but the grooming, the developing, the nurturing of a sexually healthy person so that when the subject of sex does come about, we're not so completely uh, uh, slammed with the consequences we hear about all the time and rightfully fear. Because sex, we all know, can be a dangerous and scary proposition when it's approached in unhealthy ways. So very often, again, the, the question is uh, whether particular kinds of education is appropriate or not. And as I pose this question here, how old should kids be when sex ed begins? Well, let me preface that with another question. Uh, how old are we when we begin to be sexual? And that's like my, my favorite uh, um, uh, trick question. I'm not going to, you know, I really want to try and get through the presentation as quickly as I can. I know it's the end of the day and time is short and I want to leave as much time as we have left for questions. So I'm going to try and blast through this pretty quickly, and I won't workshop it and actually ask you that question. I'll just tell you about my experience when I do ask it of groups, because invariably people start guessing right around uh, 11, 12, 13. If I say, what age do we begin to be sexual? That makes sense, right? Puberty kinds of ages. But of course, the, the trick in the question is we're human beings, and human beings are sexual beings, and it's not something that just you know, we have parts, sexual parts, that do weird things. They don't just pop out of smooth little Barbie bodies when, they, when we hit our 13th birthday. They're there from before we're born. And they're doing those goofy, embarrassing things, right? It's amazing how guys' memories are so bad if I ask a question like, at what age do we begin to have erections? Guys always start get 8, 10, 12. Again, how about before we're born? Or, that's right. Anybody who's ever changed a boy's diaper knows <laughs> that. Uh, but even in utero, even sometimes when those ultrasounds aren't so foggy and vague and hard to pick, sometimes they take the ultrasound picture at just the right moment. Oh, there's no question. It's a boy. <laughs> it's a boop, right? You know, all those, you, all those moms who thought it was always the baby kicking those. Maybe not always a foot or an elbow or, you, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious. Uh, so it's kind of this notion that, that uh, our sexuality, our sex, uh, is more what we are than what we do. And it certainly is a, a whole lot more in a comprehensive sense of our, our personhood, our, our humanness, than genital acts. And that's kind of, a, a, like I said, that overarching theme. So this question about when it begins, it begins when we begin. But of course, the, the more helpful question is uh, uh, this next point about age and stage appropriate, especially when we're dealing with kids who have uh, physical or emotional or intellectual disabilities. Sometimes it's that kind of a matching thing. So if a kid is 
chronologically 19, but intellectually 12, well, then it, we, we go to a more stage-appropriate level. Uh, but if there's appropriate sex ed for three- and four-year-olds, there shouldn't be too much of an issue for finding that beginning place, that we can always figure where the, the, the stage-appropriate place and what the appropriate lessons are. Now, I've also had these experiences working like with preschools. And again, you can imagine if you, there's a, typically a woman, sometimes a guy, but typically a woman running a little preschool, day school, you know. And I can say, hey, how about letting me come in and do some sex ed with these kids? What kind of sicko are you? <laughs> you these are three and four year old little babies and you want to come in here with your intercourse and AIDS and I didn't say that. <laughs> That's not age-appropriate subjects to talk about with three- and four-year-old little kids. But the, the mistake is in thinking that there is nothing appropriate for three- and four-year-olds. And there most definitely is a wonderful world of, of um, positive and empowering and, and uh, celebratory sex ed that happens with uh, even the, the littlest of kids. Now, a lot of it uh, has to do with sexual abuse prevention, but that should never be something that we... Uh, scare the crap out of our kids with, like a lot of the programs I've seen. You know, there's ways of doing that classic kind of good touch, bad touch, uh, which is the core of, of abuse prevention in ways that are empowering, that give kids, I mean, just imagine sitting on a mat in a little nursery school surrounded by 25, 30 little rugrats, you know, all of them screaming out in unison, I'm the boss of my body. It's, it's goosebumpy stuff, you know. <laughs> and learning about appropriate names of body parts as, as coolly and calmly and matter-of-factly as we learn about elbows and noses instead of all, you know, I do this exercise where I put poster board around the room and give everybody, I've done this with adults, with kids, with college students, and say, you know, okay, two minutes, everybody run around and write every name you've ever heard or could think of for all the body parts on all these posters. Right? So one would say penis, one would say vagina, breasts, and buttocks. But then, you know, you got some throw-ins there, like elbow and eyes. <laughs> and after three minutes, run it. you mean first they need a little permission. Really? You mean I could write anything, whatever. I don't, you can't offend me, just write it. And they're scribbling furiously, and the posters are filling up columns and columns, 30, 40, 50 words for all these body parts. The elbow page is remarkably blank. <laughs> The eyes won, you know, there was that song from the 20s, Jeepers Creepers, where'd you get those peepers, right? It's the only word I've ever heard for eyes other than eyes. But why this language? Why we grow up with pee-pee, wee-wee, foo-fee, hoo-hoo, la-la, all these, these weird words for our body parts. And, you know, the, well, one example of how that kind of education can spin around on us, as I can remember, even my own daughter, again, imagine the preschool teacher thing, <laughs> this is the sexuality educator's kid. She was teaching the kids about private parts and defining them as anything that's covered by a bathing suit. Now, my precocious little three-and-a-half-year-old is, you know, like the light bulb over the head. You know, oh! And this is what she says to her preschool teacher. My daddy kisses my private parts all the time. <laughs> you know, I got a freaked out phone call. But she's talking about this private part, right? And I used to think it was just my weird, you know, Jewish upbringing that grandmothers and tushies, as we call them. But then I, you know, then my Dominican mother-in-law, as soon as she met the baby, went, where's my little bonbon? Rip the diaper away. <laughs> right? This is, this is baked goods to a grandmother, no matter where you come from. But obviously kids need a good message that this is kind of a different body part than this. And that there are certain, you know, genitals or... Uh, awkward words that even most of us as adults are not comfortable with, like vulva. And uh, remember that, that uh, one of my favorite scenes from that old Schwarzenegger movie, Kindergarten Cop. You remember when the little kid, every chance he can get to embarrass all the grown-ups, would just blurt out, boys have a penis and girls have a vagina. And the kids would all giggle and the adults would all blush and like, okay, can we go back to talking about fire safety now? And, uh, you know, that basic sex ed 101 that we all get should be so matter-of-fact and comfortable and just part of raising the kids, you know. And it is it's beautiful in its naivete when we see, you know. Sometimes when kids get that light bulb moment, you know, imagine little 
little twins, little three, three and a half year old boy and a girl at bath time. You know, mom's filled the tub and it's all full of soap and suds and she pulls the plug to drain it and just turns just for a split second to go get some towels as the water drains out and the kids are standing up and she hears, Mom! Susie's penis fell off. <laughs> it's like lunging to the drain to catch it before it goes down, right? And she comes in, oh, you adorable little boy. Susie doesn't have a penis. Susie's a girl. See, you have a penis? She has a vagina. And, he's like, oh. and that's the kid that'll go run into kindergarten the next day. Boys have a penis. And when it's, when it's normalized in that way, you know, sexual hygiene is another critically important thing that, again, not just the little ones, but seven and eight year olds, nine and 10 year olds, 14, 15 year olds. We're very lacking sometimes in these basics of sexual health and hygiene that, again, have nothing to do with sex, or sexual activity, but just part of owning this body and being a sexually healthy person. And consider how unplussed we are teaching kids about oral hygiene. You know, translate the discomfort. You have parents standing with a kid at the bathroom sink teaching them about oral hygiene, and they're embarrassed, and they're blushing, and they're stuttering, and they say, Take this thing and squirt some of this stuff on it and rub your thingies and spit it out and go to bed. <laughs> well, well, of course we wouldn't be. Because, you know, it's a matter of fact. You brush, you squirt, you brush your teeth up and down, back and forth, you floss a little bit. Same, same kind of comfort, same kind of embracing of a uh, natural aspect of health education. So, of course, when we miss all this, we, as it says here, the great debates continue and we battle. Uh, I don't think it's ever going to get anywhere. Uh, and at the end of the day, the work ain't getting done. You know, there's, uh, of course, I, I, my biases are uh, unavoidable, and I can't, begin, I can't possibly hide them if I try. Uh, but I don't think um, either side is real. Well, even when I say either side, it's a completely artificial polarity that we've created that's not true, that there are two kinds of sex ed, and there are two camps, they dislike each other immensely, and their opposite messages, the so-called abstinence only till marriage camp and the comprehensive sex ed. So this side calls this side unrealistic prudes, and this side calls this side the condom people, and the kids are missing still. That again, it's not an event, it's a process, and it's reality-based, and it's not, a, it's not so in the crotch. It's about raising sexually healthy young people. I'm so often have been accused of being anti-abstinence, which is it's just so absurd. Like I'm going to go to second grade classrooms and say, what kids, you're not doing it yet? <laughs> abstinence sucks. But, you know. uh, but then again, it's also common to wonder how old is old enough, that age old question. Well, when is it right, the right age to have sex? In my career in, in uh, sexual and reproductive health, I met, I've met plenty of 30-somethings and 40-somethings that had no business having sex, <laughs> that were irresponsible, uneducated, just one mess after another. Um, but I've also known plenty of 17, 18-year-olds who are sexually healthy and literate and informed and uh, making healthy, health-based decisions. That, well, who am I to say uh, no? You know, we're also talking to adults, which frightens me in this day and age in a country such as ours. Uh, with a message that if you're not married, you're not to be having sex. Grown people, the abstinence only till marriage guidelines extended to age 29. Uh, and I thought that was weird too, because what happens if you turn 29 and you're still not married? We collectively as a nation say, oh, the hell with you. You might as well now, it's, uh, you know. But remember, remember, uh, remember where that phrase old maid comes from? Besides the card game we play when we're kids? What was an old maid 100 years ago? Anybody know? A woman that was still not married and having kids by about the ripe old age of 21 or 22. Because that was the only role society offered for women. Women went from being somebody's daughter to somebody's wife and mother in, in rapid succession. We talk about what, what's called a, a fertility gap, the age between when a girl can have a child and when she typically does have a child. A hundred years ago, the average age for a girl's first period was 13.7, almost 14. And the average age of marriage and childbearing was about 15 and a half to 16. 
There's your fertility gap. There's your no sex until marriage. Barely hang on, right? Now, the average age of a girl's first period is what? 11. And on a downward trend. And the average age of marriage and childbearing? 27 to 30. Now we're looking at a pretty huge, potentially 15 years, where we have this confusing, what do we do? And I'm going to show you on, I think, the next slide. Yes, we we'll talk briefly about these strange creatures called adolescents. And I say that not really to be joking, but because, well, really, what the hell are they? They're not kids, and they're not adults. And sometimes we don't know how else to treat them, so we treat them as both at the same time. We treat them as children, and we treat them as adults. Say, so you should know better, you should be smart enough, and uh, you're a minor, and you don't know anything, and, you know, they're neither children nor adults. They're adolescents. And when I talk about a changing definition of adolescent, you could see from these goofy old pictures that these are adolescents in adult roles. That during this day, and maybe even some of our generation, those of you who are my age or older, uh, you know, certainly our parents' generation, when you turned 18, you were grown. That was it. You got the hell out of the house. You got a job. Maybe a few went to college back then. I uh, went to the military, but you were 18, you were an adult. You went and started your own life. Uh, and teenager, when I was a kid, uh, was just a fancy, you know, adolescent was a fancy word, an SAT word for teenager. And teenager meant you had teen at the end of your age, 13, until you were an adult at 18. So 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, that's teenager, that's adolescent. Now we know that that's changed dramatically. Adolescence starts much younger, 10 years old, 11 years old, and lasts a hell of a lot longer. Adolescence can extend to 24, 25. Yeah, well, for some of us, yeah. And so very often that shift from adolescence to adulthood, it's really stretched out, and then it's a very dramatic jump. You know, sometimes 27-year-olds will go to college, go back home, still living with the parents, and then get married and have a kid. Or have a kid first, and then it's like crashing into adulthood and like, ah, you know. Um, so consider that as we go through. This is on your um, survival kit. This is brilliant, by the way. I wish all conferences started getting this. It's the new millennium. We really should be there already instead of reams of paper everywhere still. Uh, so you'll have this. And uh, I'm not going to spend any time on it except just to point out that this, should, this, this is a, a pictorial uh, of that notion of this lifelong developmental process uh, that begins at birth. And all of these things we learn about love and touch and empathy and trust and uh, self-soothing. I know these are critical issues for many of you uh, uh, with the particular disabilities and conditions uh, that you're challenged with. Body image issues, gender issues, uh, self-esteem. No sex here yet for, for way down uh, along, but critically important aspects of healthy sexual development. And this I've been using for a long time, uh, working with folks who work with adolescents. And I noticed uh, in putting this presentation together today just how uh, particularly relevant these issues, if you look at the uh, terms on the right side of these lists, are probably for many of your kids. That this is for, for all kids, for high functioning and, and not so much, but just normal adolescents. We see this idea coming from Scheidlinger of uh, conflicts of polarity. That adolescents and young people are these things at the same time. They're trying to assert independence, rebelling against adult control, but they need direction. They're separating and expressing their individuality, but they need to be part of a group. See, we always thought growing up that we were, we were trying to snap that umbilical cord. And now I realize with working with adolescents for so long that we never, really, we never wanted to snap it. We wanted to stretch it We're down the block, around the corner, in the car, to the mall, but we really needed to know that we can wind it back up and have some kind of connection. Uh, one of my early mentors is a guy named Dr. Michael Carrera from the Children's Aid Society in New York City, who one of the best things I ever saw, a graphic uh, representation of all kids, especially adolescents, and he called, this, this is the posture. 
right? And this is where most parents fail uh, in, in getting that point, that this is their job. You're whack. I hate you. You don't understand me. I can't wait to get the hell out of this house. This is their job. But the quiet whisper that says, please ignore this. I'm really confused. I really need your guidance. This is the normal posture of an adolescent. Uh, needing, need for closeness, but a fear of intimacy. Uh, resisting limits, of course, that's their job, but needing limits. We see just as much dysfunction, even mental illness, happen from too permissive, uh, uh, progressive, like they used to say in the 70s, uh, parents, as we do from too domineering and, and overbearing parents. Uh, the parents say, oh, sure, let them do, let them, oh, I want my kids to be independent, so they let them go off and do what the hell they want, and they crash and burn. Um, think, well, thinking about the future, when your kid could be five minutes, uh, and that orientation to the present moment, you know. Uh, there's another aspect to this that I find fascinating that talks about how adolescents return to two-year-olds in a lot of these developmental things. You know, when it comes to putting things in their mouth, you know, two-year-olds put buttons and bugs and things. Adolescents put, you know, cigarettes and drugs and things. But um, this idea of um, delayed gratification uh, starts with toilet training. What do you mean I have to hold it? I feel tension. I want it gone. Uh, that's the message we get when we're learning to toilet. Like, oh, I got to sit with this pressure? Are you kidding me? It felt so great when I just, wow, and big people came and took it, the, the diaper away and rubbed and touched and made the smell go away. Uh, well, we all remember, you know, getting five bucks for delivering papers or something and want to, oh, I got to go out to the mall. And a parent saying, uh, what, is it burning a hole in your pocket? Why don't you save it? <laughs> the hell does that mean when you're 12? Five, uh, save it? For what? Oh, you might get another five dollars and you can buy something for ten dollars. I think it's buy something, you, you know. This is what we see. Uh, this was a model that we came up with a long, long time ago. It just seems to work. And again, it doesn't matter the age or stage of the kid. It's, it's, uh, it's not an action model. It's an attitude one. It's a frame for, regardless of the subject matter, for maintaining that relationship from young ages through adolescence, through uh, transitioning to adulthood, uh, which again, nowadays is... Uh, just a hell of a lot more awkward for all of our kids. Uh, so uh, this is also on your um, disc there. So I hope this will be just a, a kind of a reminder and a, a tool for you to refer back to. This is also on your uh, disc, so I won't spend too much time going through it. But um, this adapted from the work of CECAS, the Sexuality Information and Education Council of the United States. It's an oldie but a goodie, a high mileage item. And uh, this, to, to me, this also helps to define that bigger picture of sexuality education and sexual health because you start to see when you look at these characteristics uh, how few of them also relate to whether or not kids are having sex or not. Uh, that's something else we get a lot uh, with sex ed programs. Kids will say, oh, I don't have to be in here because I'm, I'm a virgin. Well, aside from the fact that virgin means different things to different kids, you know. Uh, on a tragic note, I once had to deliver a positive HIV test result to a girl who argued with me and said, it's not possible, I'm a virgin. A couple more questions down the road found out that we had very different definitions of what that word meant. And, you know, with just a couple questions, it wasn't a real mystery to see how this virgin contracted HIV before losing her virginity. Um, but uh, even for real virgins, uh, this is, again, even better for the virgins, because this stuff cemented as a foundation long before that decision uh, is hitting them in the frontal lobe uh, is really the ideal way of ensuring a future of sexual health, where in the ideal sense, our sexuality is a part of us that is celebratory, that does give us joy and never regret and consequence. And you know, look around, look at the world in which we live, look at our own lives, our families, our friends, we know Unfortunately, way too often, our sexuality is a source of shame and guilt and embarrassment and regret and sometimes consequence. Uh, and, you know, every sexuality educator is an idealist. Some would add the descriptor hopeless idealist for the more cynical, 
but you know that's that's kind of the ultimate ideal that sexually healthy people hook up and have sexually healthy relationships and when they result in children they enter into sexually healthy families and sexually healthy communities and before you know it you have a world where a society where we don't have to talk about all this horribly depressing consequency stuff all the time because as a nation we become sexually healthier uh, and you know there's that classic image of denial uh, the ostrich with its head in the sand although I've recently learned that ostriches don't actually do that I was really kind of disappointed I thought that just pops such a huge bubble because it's such a great image we all know that oh denial right bury your head in the sand ostriches don't do that uh, but the image is, is uh, is a good one but you think about you know just the dynamics of that kind of position as a particularly vulnerable part of our anatomy that is even more vulnerable if we're sticking our head in the sand and vulnerable usually for a good swift kick you know uh, so denial seldom helps uh, in any of these realities so whether it's understanding growing up even something like puberty education it's I know it sounds bizarre oh wow it sounds bizarre to think of uh, kids being traumatized by their puberty, but going into it blind and not having any idea what's happening to our bodies can be pretty terrifying if you think about our own experiences from those changes. So I want to blast ahead. Again, you could read through these on your own. It's about relationship to self, with families, with others, then gradually learning about interpersonal relationships, first with peers, then ultimately potential romantic partners. Um, I do want to plug these books. You also have these on your, your uh, disc. Uh, I just love them. Uh, I grew up with a ridiculous book called Where Did I Come From that had on the cover a, a big cartoon sperm with a top hat and spats and a cane and, you know. Uh, these books are just as fun and cartoony and safe and light and perfect for kids, but they're just the real deal. All of them are hosted by... Uh, a really awkward, embarrassed little bee, uh, and a, a very forward, uh, bold um, bird. And they talk you through. Their first book was the one on the right. It's perfectly normal, uh, changing bodies, growing up, sex and sexual health. That's kind of the puberty one. And it's uh, the, the intended audience when they wrote it was 9 to 14. Uh, I found this to be exceptional for adolescents, even all the way up to 21 uh, with any kind of uh, learning disabilities or emotional and uh, mental uh, challenges. Uh, then there was such a wonderful response to their first book, they were begged, please, I, my kids are younger, I need a book. They wrote, It's So Amazing, for six to nine-year-olds. But then there was even, you know, still a lot of parents uh, with questions for the, the little, little ones. So they wrote, It's Not the Stork, a book about girls, boys, babies, bodies, families, and friends for uh, the real little ones. And um, this I don't want to take the time to talk about, but there was maybe one or two points. That this was, uh, the next two slides, this was something that was written by kids. Uh, it was a, a, um, a, a symposium of kids from all over the world, obviously very uh, intellectual uh, kids. But they were challenged to come up with a message to their peers all over the world, and they came up with these 10-step uh, uh, idea of sexual ethics about talking, communication, not using sex as a weapon, um, being m mature and responsible for your actions, talking about consequences, um, understanding the, that desire does not necessarily have to mean action and, and how to respect things like no and negotiation skills, trust, honesty, monogamy, all these wonderful concepts, uh, not making sexual decisions under the influence and independence, etc. strong relationships, uh, knowing when relationships are harmful, and uh, um, educating others about sexual responsibility. And I think this is about the last slide. Um, just again, after 15 years in the field, I found that even in the early 90s when the new buzzword became youth development, I found it was still so focused on uh, prevention and a kind of a goal-oriented message. This whole to say no to sex, say no to drugs, say no to gangs, like, the, you know, like sex was a vice. Uh, and they were fragmented programs and frustratingly 
uh, uh, ineffective. So this slide is really just a, an idea, hopefully a, a, a spark of an idea, to change the paradigm, to think about sex ed in promotional ways, in promoting sexual health, in promoting self-esteem, in promoting sound decision-making uh, at any age, from 5 to 25, uh, and comfortably recognizing that kids, like adults, are sexual beings, and that it's part of our job to guide them in that process, as we do with every other process. You know, Freud was the one who coined the term psychosexual development, because he recognized that there's no separating psychological development from sexual development. And that's kind of the beauty of medical nomenclature and language. You can just make up nouns by, uh, make up adjectives by smashing nouns together. So you take psych psychology and sexuality and make psychosexual. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. We've got about 10 minutes, I think, maybe a little bit less for a few questions, please. Do you recommend uh, an adolescent, it's going to be 16, but maybe after maturity-wise, they're going to be like that 13 or 14. They're already very sexually aware now. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> right. Excellent. Excellent. Cool. No, really, really good uh, first question. Um, I'm kind of on, on both sides of that, that certain things are more comfortable moms and daughters and certain things dads and sons but I've also been doing a program for about uh, 11 or so years. Uh, it started with when, when I saw the first uh, uh, Girls Gone Wild uh, video commercial on TV and I realized there was a cleave in my brain that there's like a horny 17 year old who lives in here that as soon as the commercial came on he went <laughs> boobies and then much, much slower on the uptake was the father of a daughter part of my brain that went where did these girls get the, how did this, where the hell are these girls' fathers? So I've been doing this program called Daddy's Little Girl, the role of fathers in the healthy sexual development of their daughters. Uh, so sometimes both parents, sometimes dad, sometimes mom. But in the example you gave, um, I think any situation, the most critical thing is avoiding any shaming kinds of things. Anything that they're probably embarrassed about already. One of the other dads, I think he had to leave, was asking about... Uh, um, nocturnal emissions, that seeing his son, you know, come running out of the bedroom in the morning all freaked out and embarrassed and, and washing his underwear in the sink and, you know, dad, well-meaning, wanted to, uh, you know, you want to talk about this? No! No! Uh, you know, so uh, approaching these things gently and lovingly and normalizing and, of course, accepting without freaking them out and getting them any more defensive and embarrassed that they, uh, than they already are. Uh, but normalizing is, is really the key. Uh, it doesn't have to be a sit down, you know, clear the dishes from the table. Okay, before you get up and go back to the Xbox, we're going to have a little, uh, you know. But um, in the car is always one of my favorite places for those kinds of conversations. Or the credo of all sexuality educators is the, the teachable moments. You know, something on television, especially with the crap they're watching. You, you know, I saw this new one, Glee. And have you seen that show yet? It's like these girls in the hot tubs and like, oh, God. At the, at the least, I might think they're all garbage, but at the, at the least, they're rich with teachable moments. There's so much great stuff in those crap shows uh, to talk, to say, what do you think about what you just saw? Or um, which one? Yes, or my daughter's gaga over, uh, what is it, Degrassi. But she gets pissed if I call it a soap opera. Um, so, you know, normalizing, recognize, yeah, this, you're a guy, this is, we all deal with this, and, you know, comes with, it's part of being a proud penis owner, and um, that beginning with that normalizing kind of thing, uh, but it's certainly nothing to be avoided. Sir. Right. Aspergerish. Kind of 
Yes, absolutely. And, you know, it goes to your question, too, as well. Um, I think a lot of it, I had a good conversation earlier today also uh, with one of the other presenters. He said, you can spot uh, the kids with the learning disabilities in the men's room. They're the ones that will come up to the, the urinal next to where somebody is instead of three or four over, <laughs> right? Um, and I, I, I love that kind of innocence, naivete that comes from being a little bit socially uh, more immature, uh, which I, th I think it's sad that we quash that, because all of those social uh, mores really are fear-based anyway. I mean, the reason why most guys will go three, four urinals over and keep space is there's a homophobia, and, you know, why is he getting next to me? Uh, and, uh, I think it's refreshing that somebody's just that naive and go, oh, you know, how are you doing? And, uh, just, right? But the lesson in both of these questions is, again, I always try and avoid a message about right and wrong in favor of appropriate and inappropriate, and in emphasizing a public versus a private behavior. That, you know, with, with masturbatory or self-pleasuring kinds of things, rather than, you know, the old school, stop that, don't touch that, you'll go blind. <laughs> you, you know, instead, an emphasis on, I know that feels good, but that's something that we do in private when we're alone, in the bathroom or in the bedroom or something, you know, not in the produce section at Winn-Dixie, <laughs> uh, right? And, uh, again, age and stage appropriate, but really emphasizing the idea of appropriate private behavior and boundaries. Uh, even the youngest kids or the youngest mentality can grasp an idea of uh, the importance of boundaries. That even if you think this is great, other people might be uncomfortable and you go change by yourself in private. Uh, sometimes there is a little thrill at the lascivious kind of, you know, exhibitionism that, again, no matter how much they may be into it, they have to understand uh, their, the effect of their actions on others. And that's, the, that's part of the boundary setting and negotiating just, you know, life. Yeah. Teenage boys who have sexual urges uh -huh. rubs themselves, rubs themselves against the bed. Right. He has not yet figured out how to masturbate. Do you advocate teaching him or letting him figure it out himself? Hmm. This is an ongoing debate with my husband. It's a good question. Uh, anybody remember Joycelyn Elders? Yes, Surgeon General. Yes, who was fired. By Bill Clinton. Ironically, the delicious irony of hindsight, right? <laughs> Had he listened to her instead of firing her, perhaps his presidency will be remembered for something else for the next 400 years. Uh, but yeah, she was fired for talking about masturbation because she didn't bring it up. She was asked a question from somebody in the press how she felt about teaching it in schools. And of course, nobody interpreted the question to be like a lab, you know, lecture demonstration. Okay, boys and girls, today you're going But just what it is, some people do it, some people don't, nothing bad will happen to you, you won't go blind, you, you know, just pretty much the same way as the Palm Beach County School District curriculum had the definition, uh, you know. Um, it is kind of a natural thing that I don't think anybody would need an instructional, uh, you know, uh, but just, again, an emphasis on uh, appropriate behavior, public and private. Um, and I don't think calling any undue attention to it would probably, how old? And how old would you say developmentally? Yeah, I don't think calling any undue attention to it would be essential. Yeah, like, hey, you're doing that wrong. <laughs> so I'm sure he'll figure it out. But as long as there's an emphasis, see if it's like rubbing on things, in the family room, then the message could be about uh, more private behavior. Yeah. Uh, someone was asked earlier that um, he was playing with the crappiest sense of that he had. Yeah. And he, you know, he wasn't sure if he wanted, if it was because he wanted a man where he got married mm -hmm. or whether he was half the sense that I thought it would be a good idea to talk to somebody, but, you know, can you kind of address that a little? Um, at that age, I don't think it would be inappropriate to think about uh, some very, very basic kinds of sex therapy. Uh, in term, you know, I would approach that almost like um, desensitizing a phobia. You know, beginning with with, with a kind of gradual touch. It doesn't have to be partnered, uh, but you know, kind of a gradual touch and. 
um, maybe even with a significant person, like not a love interest, but a loved one, uh, to begin to gr grow more comfortable and address the tactile defensiveness. And then let the, the kind of moral internal questions about love and relationship and virginity percolate in the context of the possibility of a romantic relationship. You didn't want to be in years of an excuse for Right, right. That's why it's, you know, you separate them a little bit and get him more comfortable with intimate touch. See, there's, there's another concept that Americans just brain cramp over, the idea of non-sexual intimate touch. I've been training massage therapists for 20 years, and that's what they do. And, you know, I've seen it so many times, men in, you know, they go to the massage clinics with the students and they think, okay, this is not, there's that masseuse, right? All that innuendo stuff, the massage parlor is really like a whorehouse. And, uh, but legitimate medical massage therapy, people, most people get that that's not sexual. There's still guys who think, you know, happy endings and the like, but uh, that's prostitution in the state of Florida. But uh, um, intimate touch especially men, I hate to be sexist, but, but men register that as sexual. You know, how many times I've heard couples complain a million times, one more sec, um, you know, a uh, heterosexual couple, she'll say, uh, you know, we're sitting on the couch watching TV and I just want to caress or massage his neck or whatever, and he gets an erection and thinks it's sexy time. <laughs> and, ah, oh, <laughs> you know, because touch and affection and, and intimate touch uh, I think that would be a good uh, stage, I'm guessing, uh, for him to start exploring that. And kind of, again, two issues concurrent, uh, desensitize that I, I've seen that tactile defensiveness. Uh, it separated a little bit from this idea of intimacy and connection between people. First, a non-sexual connection, and then gradually when, it's, when he's ready, when it's appropriate. Sir. Right. Teach them call nine one one. I have, but not, uh, I think kids pick up things from television or from other kids. I don't recall, I'm trying to think of, of an instance like that that came about directly resulting from education, especially, you know, on the subject uh, we're talking about of education that's emphasizing nobody's allowed to touch you, uh, uh, you know, um, the, but you, you know, a couple of exceptions if you're at the doctor or whatever. And uh, even with young, young kids, we talk about learning to bathe themselves. And um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of how that could backfire and put an idea in a kid's head to have fun with it.
Of course. The quick answer is sometimes we can't. That, you know, kids can be cruel, and kids going to play the dozens and make fun and pick on, of course, sure, yeah. But working on their strengths, where you can have those teachable moments and talk about events like that, at least in a reparative kind of way, uh, and, um, you know, maybe try and, and develop the resilience and, uh, against the other kids. Uh, a little more defense uh, that what the, you know blow off what the other kids say. Uh, I know the, 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 that it's a challenge. Uh, the other question that came up in exactly that teachable moment is: uh -huh. Should it be teachable right now? I wanted to go and strangle one of course, them. Of course, of course. I think it is an issue for the school. Go ahead. But should you, at that point in time, just kind of blow it off in front of the kid, not make a big deal out of it? You're right, and run, yeah, I'd be the same way. But I think what you just said. Yeah. But little interventions where they can happen. Like I would think it's an, it could be an easy part of an IEP to ensure private bathroom access. Maybe I'm naive myself. Uh, but I like what you just said, you know. Try and minimize uh, in front of him and deal with it as best you can through the systems kind of a way. I know we're past time. Uh, I have business cards out on the table there. Please feel free to call me any kind of questions or issues. Uh, and there's some brochures if anybody requires uh, counseling or referrals uh, for other uh, assistance. And I've, uh, I'm grateful for sharing your day with you. Thanks for sticking around so long. <laughs>